This is my workbench. It sucks. It's an old walnut dresser I found on the curb. Someone painted it blue. I was in the middle of restoring it when I realized I needed a proper workbench. Something sized to my workshop, which is a balcony. I'm not a pro woodworker. I don't have all the tools, the knowledge, or the space. I don't even have a workbench. But I love to work with my hands and solve problems. Plus, I had a business idea to build poop stools out of found furniture and construction lumber and sell them online. See? Problem solving. After deciding on some rough dimensions, I made a quick shopping list and headed to the lumber department of my local big box store. I selected the best two and four by fours I could find, loaded them up in my 2012 Prius with leather seats, and was officially off on my woodworking journey. I think this stuff is Douglas fir, which isn't ideal for building a bench. It's not dry, square, or straight. It's gonna take some work to flatten, but that's okay. I'll Google it. I wasn't sure how tall to make it. I'm about six foot three and I didn't want to be constantly bending over, so I settled on what felt like a comfortable arm dangle at 36 inches, which happens to be standard countertop height. The top will be 48 inches left to right and the depth will be this times two, which after flattening and glue up comes out to between 15 and 16 inches. Time to cut. Duh forgot to film that part. All the cuts made, there it is, put together for the first time. That resembles a workbench top. Look, it's already strong enough to hold a rusty old pair of whatever these are called pliers. Not bad. Now to prep for the glue up, I run the orbital sander over the faces of the boards. I know this is a far cry from true flattening, so I'm just trying to knock down the peaks and rough patches. Figuring with enough glue and clamping, the gaps will get filled in, no problem. Finally getting some use out of this kettlebell. This here is a tack cloth. It's like a sticky, waxy gauze pad for removing dust. You use it between steps when you're finishing or sanding something. But honestly, what I'm doing right here is pretty sloppy, imprecise work. So it's probably not necessary for this particular use, but I had some, you know? So what the hell? Now, I chose the boards in this order mainly on how flat they felt against each other and against the dresser surface, which will be the bottom. But I did consider the front board and picked this one, figuring all the knots would look cool. But I probably should have used this second board since it has tighter grain, which seems like it would hold up better to the abuses the front board is certainly going to take. Ah yeah, well. Some confusion reducing notes on the boards and we're ready to glue. We've moved indoors to my other workbench, a dining room table. I'm excited to use these pipe clamps. These things are great. The pipes are three quarter inch black galvanized steel. I read online somewhere they're a touch softer than the standard silver galvanized, so the clamp bites into them a bit better. True? Probably. Both are fine. Already, I'm making a mistake. I should have covered the pipes in tape or plastic wrap to keep the coating from interacting with the glue and wood. More on that later. Okay, actual glue time. The moment during any woodworker's day when you hope no one needs anything. Never glued anything this big before, so to be safe, I get the big container of glue. I'm sure it'll be enough. It's a huge container. How could I possibly run out? I'm using Tight Bond 3, which is supposed to have better water resistance properties than 2. Since this will be living outside on a balcony, it'll be subject to the elements. Lots of daily southwestern sun, mainly, but some winter rain too, and the occasional raccoon turd.
Almost there, but shockingly the bottle is getting a bit light, so I rest it spout side down for a little gravity assist. Thanks gravity. It occurs to me I've got a whole supply of glue in the form of drip out puddles down below. Yeah, good one. That really made a difference. Well, shoot. Anyone that's ever finished a milkshake will recognize a sound you're about to hear. It's a sound we all dread. No more milkshake. The sound of not buying enough damn glue. Ah, I'm so close. How could this happen? But I bought the big one. I know there's still glue in the bottle, covering the walls, so I try a little physical persuasion. Nah, that didn't help much. Wait a minute, I know. Surgery. Thanks to a sharp razor knife, I'm able to slice the bottle right in half, giving me wide open access to that precious ooze inside. Beige gold, baby! Quick note on safety, you might be thinking that slicing something round covered in wet glue with wet glue on your hands is inadvisable, and you'd be right. In this case, I made sure to keep my fingers out of the path of any slicing vector in case of a slip. It's one of the many calculated risks you'll see me take in this series. Safety always being front and center in my mind. Not that I'm perfect about it, far from it. I take risks in accordance with my own risk tolerances and experience, and I hope you learn from my approach and the mistakes I make along the way. That's one reason I'm making these videos. Woodworking is a dangerous hobby. We're dealing with very strong physics and it's important to respect that. Be safe, be smart, do your thinking ahead of time and always pause if you have any hesitation before taking an action. Trust your instinct if something feels off. You can control most probabilities, but mistakes still will happen. So it's a good idea to have a first aid kit on hand and know how to use it. No project is worth a finger, an eye, or any other part of you. I was able to get just enough glue from the bottle, but this is the front board, the most important board, the big toe of the boards, if you will. Of all the boards to skimp on, it shouldn't be this one. Luckily, I remember I've got a bottle of Tight Bond 2 in my nightstand, which saves the day. Smush it on there and rub it all around. And that's the primary gluing. A little sloppy. Okay, a lot sloppy. A little underprepared. Okay, a lot underprepared. But we got it done. It's time to clamp. Anticipating squeeze out, I kept the camera on the end, but see here on the right, I'm placing blocks of two by fours in the clamps to distribute the force more evenly. These pipe clamps can really crank down hard and they have a satisfying feel when you do. Sturdy and smooth, like me when I shower. They feel like you'll break before they do. It's a good feeling. On the sides, I've wrapped plastic around some two by fours to help hold the boards top to bottom. Calls, I think is the word you might use to try to impress your woodworker buddies. After initial positioning, I realize a potential mistake. All the force is currently concentrated across the lower half of the piece. First, I try moving the blocks to perpendicular, but I quickly come up with a better solution. Build a time machine, go back in time, and buy more clamps. That's not an option. So I messily move the two middle clamps to the top and change the angle of the distribution boards like so. Now, at least the clamping forces will be a bit more spread out. Not as good as having lots of clamps or knowing what you're doing, but at least all the force isn't concentrated along one half or the other. I hope. It'll have to do. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Like, subscribe, and support to help us reach a larger audience. Join me in embracing the woodworking community's supportive spirit of cooperation, resourcefulness, and learning from our own and each other's mistakes by keeping the comments cool and respectful. In the next part, we'll fill gaps and flatten. Be safe, be smart, and remember, get two glues.